Uh, the first weekend of January, uh, my wife Laura and my daughter Summer said they wanted to go see a movie, the space movie. And so I bought tickets for an alien kind of movie, uh, having no idea that they meant the actual space movie, uh, Hidden Figures. Uh, it has been a long time since I have clapped at the end of the movie. But I clapped at the end of that movie. It was awesome, and the book uh, was even better afterwards. On February 20, 1962, John Glenn sat on top of a 95-foot-tall intercontinental ballistic missile at Cape Canaveral. After 11 delays, the Mercury Atlas VI finally took off from Launch Complex 14. It reached an escape velocity of 17,544 miles per hour, uh, orbited the Earth three times, and splashed down four hours, 55 minutes, and 23 seconds later, about 800 miles southeast of Bermuda. John Glenn was an instant hero, the first American to orbit the Earth. But like every epic story, there's often an even better backstory. The greatest challenge facing NASA wasn't getting a man into space. The greatest challenge was returning him safely to the earth. And that's where a woman, a black woman named Catherine Coleman Goble Johnson enters the equation. Calculating John Glenn's uh, re-entry into the Earth's atmosphere required the very best, the very brightest mathematical minds, and Catherine was right at the top of the list. But in 1962, it was a white world. I mean, she had to use the color bathroom, and it was a man's world. But uh, you can't keep a good woman down. There's a good opportunity right there. Um, yeah. Uh, when it came to calculating trajectories and computing launch windows, no one was better than Catherine, and John Glenn knew it. So before the launch, in part because John Glenn didn't trust these new machines called computers, before there were computer computers, there were human computers. And so John Glenn said, get the girl to check the numbers. Well, the girl was none other than Catherine. John Glenn wasn't willing to take off until Catherine had checked off on those numbers. And if they were good enough for Catherine Johnson, they were good enough for John Glenn. Now, I don't want to overstate the facts. and Maybe they could have found someone else to do it. But from where I sit, if Catherine doesn't do what she does, John Glenn doesn't do what he did. And if John Glenn doesn't orbit the earth, we don't shoot the moon. And if we don't shoot the moon, the Soviet Union does. And if the Soviet Union wins a space race, they might win the Cold War. And we might live in a very different world. What I'm getting at is that there are people we have never heard of, hidden figures, who change the course of history. And if Catherine hadn't been awarded the Presidential Medal of Freedom at the age of 97 two years ago, I'm not sure any of us would even know her name. And this is a woman that helped put a man on the moon, for goodness sake. I think what's true of Catherine Johnson is true of many of you. At least that's how I see you. What's true of NASA is true of this church. There are a lot of hidden figures changing the course of history. If you have a Bible, I want you to turn this weekend to Ephesians chapter 5. I want to share a message titled Hidden Figures. Uh, let me offer a few reminders at the outset. You can't go to church because you are the church. The church is not a building, it's not an organization, it's not a name or a program or a doctrinal statement. Now, it can have all of those things, but a church is people, people with histories and personalities and idiosyncrasies. 
uh, people with uh, dysfunctions, but people that God has also called, people that God has gifted to serve his purposes. And each one of us are a part of this thing called the body of Christ, the church. Now, we're not one church with eight campuses. We have thousands of locations. We are wherever you are, Uh, your school, your workplace, your home. That's your pulpit. And the people that God has surrounded you with in those environments, that's your congregation. We're about everywhere in this city. And praise God for it. And so we gather at eight campuses across the metro D.C. area every weekend, but this isn't the game. This is the locker room. The game is played Monday to Friday as you live out your faith one day at a time. We have a simple saying around here. Uh, We want you to be a part of the dream that God has given us. And he's given us a God-sized dream. Uh, 20 expressions by the year 2020. And uh, so we have eight campuses, but uh, we also have a couple cafes, right? A a movie theater and a dream center, by the way, that just put uh, pads around the gym. Do you know what that means? It's almost game time. Uh, The doors are almost ready to open. But we want to be a part of the dream that God has given you. And I want you to understand that that you represent us. And more importantly, you represent Christ in your home, in your workplace, at your school, uh, in the boardroom, in the classroom, in the locker room, in the courtroom, in the hospital room, in the caucus room. What I want to do this weekend is just remind us of who we are and what we're about. We are the body of Christ, and we're about the Father's business. Ephesians 5, it's a beautiful chapter. Let me see if I can ramp into it. We're only going to look at at one verse, kind of zoom in on it, but uh, let me take the long road getting there. Right at the beginning of the chapter, it says that we are dearly loved children. Isn't that beautiful? That's who you are. That's whose you are. It tells us to walk in the way of love. That's our answer to everything. It says that we are the light of the world. We don't curse the darkness. We light a candle. Uh, We criticize by creating. We start better businesses. We produce better film. We, We draft better legislation. We do it better with the help of the Holy Spirit for God's glory. And can I just say that we need the best and the brightest among us in the darkest places. God doesn't just call pastors to pastor. He calls doctors to doctor and lawyers to lawyer and teachers to teach and artists to art and laborers to labor and politicians to politic. And you fill in the blank with whatever it is that you do. It says, be very careful how you live, not as unwise, but as wise. It says, make the most of every opportunity. It's the Greek word kairos. It says, understand what the Lord's will is. It says, don't get drunk. Good advice right there. But instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. It says, give thanks for everything. And then it says, submit to Christ. All of this in Ephesians 5. And then there's this beautiful picture of marriage. And I preached this passage at a lot of weddings that I've officiated. But uh, I've come to realize that it's not just about marriage. In fact, it's not even mainly about marriage. And I'll explain that in a moment. But Paul talks about the two becoming one flesh. That moment when a marriage is consummated. In the eyes of God, uh, you aren't married when you sign the marriage certificate. Uh, If that was the case, I'm in trouble because I forgot a few of those. (laughs) It's not when you say, I do. 
I know we live in a culture that is, in many ways, devalued and redefined sex, but it was God's idea in the first place, and, and he wrote the rules. And so here's the deal. Sex is a sacred covenant between a husband and a wife, and that's how two become one. And so now we find ourselves at this place in the chapter where, where Paul says something pretty amazing. He says in verse 32, and we'll put it on the screen. This is a profound mystery. And then he throws a little curveball at us. This is a profound mystery, but I'm talking about Christ and the church. Now listen, marriage is a mystery, no doubt, right? Okay, Laura and I have been married 24 years. We got married when we were children. <laughs> we had no clue. The good news is we have finally uh, figured it out. <laughs> Been there, done there, bought, bought the t-shirt. And if you believe that, I have a bridge you can buy. The more you know, the more you know how much you don't know. I'll be honest, marriage is even more of a mystery to me now, but I receive that as a gift from the Lord. And so Paul then goes on to say, the church is a profound mystery. Let me paint a picture this weekend. In 1958, Leonard Reed wrote a brilliant essay titled, I pencil. So brilliant that decades later, one of my teachers in grad school actually uh, assigned that essay as kind of an example of one of the greatest essays ever written. And I, I can't disagree. Uh, it's written in the first person uh, from the point of view of a simple lead pencil like this one. The pencil uh, declares, I am a mystery, more so than a tree or a sunset or even a flash of lightning. But sadly, I am taken for granted by those who use me as if I were a mere incident and without background. We take the pencil for granted. Yes, because it's so simple. Uh, but the pencil in the essay pushes back a little bit. Simple, yet not a single person on the face of this earth knows how to make me. So Leonard Reed goes on to detail the genealogy of a pencil. It comes from a cedar tree in Oregon, which no one can manufacture. The loggers cut it down, and then the truckers ship it to Leandro, California, where millers saw it into slats. They tint it and wax it. The lead middle is a composite made of graphite mined in Sri Lanka mixed with a Mississippi mud and candelilla wax from Mexico. The uh, feral, right up here, uh, is a mix of zinc and copper, and the eraser there at the very end, kind of that crowning glory, is rapeseed oil from the Dutch East Indies and a pigment called cadmium sulfide. So this pencil uh, took loggers and truckers and millers, and miners, and sweepers, and retailers, and assembly line workers. And then Leonard Reed comes back to his original premise that no one person could make a pencil. The pencil says, millions of human beings have had a hand in my creation. I pencil am a complex combination of miracles. Then the pencil makes one last overarching observation, which I love. 
Since only God can make a tree, I insist that only God can make me. How great is that? I love it. I pencil, I church. The church, so much bigger than any one of us, so much bigger than all of us. Why? Because it's not our church, it's his church. And he said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. But, but he does it through ordinary people, number two, pencils. Like you and like me. And what I want to do this weekend is just sharpen a couple of pencils. In 2003, Martha Lesmiss started attending National Community Church. Shortly thereafter, she started serving in Crosswalk Kids. She was a part of our launch team at Boston. And uh, at the time, NCC was about 80% single 20-somethings, and Martha was 63 back then. And so she upped our average age quite a bit. For 13 years, Martha served faithfully in Crosswalk Kids, uh, the kind of person that changes the temperature in the room. I love the way Pastor Joel describes her as a fully matured oak tree surrounded by seedlings. <laughs> then last year, Martha was diagnosed with cancer. I think we have a picture of Martha. I want you to see her. And Friday, Martha went to be with the Lord. And I immediately thought of Psalm 116, 15. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of his saints. Martha was a saint. I just have this hunch that on Friday she was crowned homecoming queen. Now, Martha had a tough time accessing email. <laughs> so she got printed notes from Nina, our children's pastor. And she had a hard time sitting on the floor. But man, she could captivate kids with Bible stories. And so uh, she always put her fingerprint on it. During a lesson on manna, she took bread and just sprinkled it over the kids. <laughs> Why not? And one time she was doing a lesson on Abraham and she showed up with a full camping tent that had to be set up in the movie theater. She sat inside the tent with a flashlight and a Bible and she taught the kids about Abraham's faith journey from Ur to Canaan. Come on, that's awesome. So here's the thing. Thousands of you have never even heard of Martha. She's a hidden figure. She's now part of the cloud of witnesses that the writer of Hebrew talks about. And we wouldn't be who we are or where we are as a church without Martha. Number two pencil. But God sharpened her and used her to serve this church to advance his kingdom. Now, I could tell you a hundred stories like that one. I could go old school and I could talk about Tony and Valerie Snesco or Brian and Raquel Jerebeck or Nathan and Christy Bellette or Jay and Carrie Cash. Or I could go new school and talk about Aaron Welty or Brian and Kim Hill, Tim and Allie Underwood or Allison Shaw, uh, Tara, Christy, Linda and Nicole out in Gainesville or man, Philip and Lindsay, uh, Tim and Sarah. And the list goes on and on and on. Hidden figures, but people that God has used to serve this church in advance his kingdom. So let me just say this uh, to everyone who attends each of our campuses, those who give and serve 
and invite. We, we wouldn't be who we are without you. And you may not even think that. And now I'm looking out and, and I'm seeing faces and names that, man, I should have said their name. We have a core value that everyone is invaluable and irreplaceable. And we believe that. You have a gift to offer this church. You have a role to play. You have a mission trip to go on. You have a small group to lead. You have a ministry to serve in just like Martha. Let me share one more story. A week ago, Laura was in Greece visiting our missionaries, Tony and uh, Jamie Sebastian, uh, along with Nina, Pastor Joel's wife. And uh, she spent much of the week in refugee camps, uh, loving and serving and cleaning and eating because you can't visit a refugee without them extending hospitality and serving you a meal. Well, that meant that Josiah and I were on our own for about a week and Long story short, we're going to order some carry out, okay? It's just going to happen that way. Uh, but there was one meal that didn't just taste good, it felt good. Noopsa Philip Vang attends our Lincoln Theater campus. He came here to do an MBA program at Georgetown. He's the son of Hmong refugees from Laos. They escaped the Viet Cong in the middle of the night. His father's sister and grandfather were killed by gunfire as they fled that country. In the middle of the night, uh, Noobs' father went back and buried his grandfather. And then they made it across the Mekong River to Thailand, eventually immigrated to America. That was 1976. His dad worked multiple jobs, slept in a car between them. His mother did her best to learn English and try to make ends meet for kids. Reality, it was a daily struggle for survival. Noopsa says, as a son of refugees, their struggle to make a new life in America, their constant struggle to be considered American, their hard work and survival to give me a better life is my daily motivation to make the most of this life that God has given me. Many Hmong people my age cared deeply for their parents that came to the U.S., because they gave up their dreams, sacrificed everything. In many ways, as children of refugees, we are the hopes and dreams of our parents. So Noopsa moves to D.C., but he misses his mom's cooking. Who doesn't? But he comes up with an idea called Fudini. Why not deliver authentic ethnic food? And here's the key made by refugees themselves who might not have a tough time finding other employment because of the language barrier, but they can cook like crazy. And so I met Noobs at a Listen and Learn event hosted by Pastor Dave and Kate Schmidgall, and he employs our friend Hassoun, a refugee from Syria who is an amazing cook. So Hassoun made dinner a week ago Tuesday, and Noopsa delivered it to our door while Laura was in the refugee camps in Greece. Hallelujah. <laughs> Jehovah Jireh, the Lord provides. And that's called the kingdom of God. That's the son of refugees who hasn't forgotten who he is or where he's from, who hasn't forgotten the least of these and that's just one expression of who we are. By the way, if you want to order a meal, it's foodini.com. Uh, F-O-O-D, food, and hini, H-I-N-I, -I, as in Houdini. Uh, and if we all order on the same day, they are in serious trouble. It's a startup. And so let's spread out our orders over the next couple of months. If I ask how many of you know Noopsa, only a few hands would go up. He's a hidden figure. But I think his dream is an expression of this church. 
And by the way, we have 190 people who serve on our refugee care team. Hidden figures making an eternal difference. So many other stories I'd love to tell you. But let's do this. On the way in this weekend, uh, you should have gotten an annual report. Looks a little something like this. And uh, I want you to take it out. There's a little page right there at the beginning after our core convictions. And uh, uh, I want you to hear what I'm about to say. This thing is filled with numbers. But it's not about numbers. It's about the pictures. It's about the people. Every number has a name. Every name has a story. And every story matters to God. And so we call it an annual report, but it's really a praise report. It's really Psalm 118, 23. Look what the Lord has done. It's an audit of God's goodness. It's an altar to God's faithfulness. It's not anything that we've accomplished. Uh, We can't save a single person, but he can, and he has. And so last year, uh, if you begin to flip through it, we baptized 73 people. Come on. 103 people who were introduced to Christ through the Alpha Course, uh, 4,000 meals served through in service, Uh, 264 people went on 27 missions trips, Uh, I love this, 304,000 podcast downloads from 195 countries. That's our extended family. 178,981 beverages sold last year at Ebenezer's. By the way, uh, two weeks ago, Friday and Saturday, you remember those days? (laughs) I think the two best days in our 10-year history as a coffee house. So listen, one way or the other, the kingdom is advancing. (laughs) And every penny of profit we give to missions, total missions giving last year, uh, general missions are DC Dream Center and Prockvert Cafe in Berlin, $4,120,000. And that might be a good spot for us just to stop and praise God. Can we do that? Now, I know that, you know, at a macro level, that's a little bit about what God's doing. And we kind of zoomed in micro level on on Martha and Noobsa and so many other stories that could be told. Um, But I want to offer one last little reminder. Now, now I promise you, uh, we want to do our best to serve you. We want to do our best to equip you. We want to help you with your marriages. I want to help you with your dating. And then help you with your marriages. And then we want to help you with your parenting. Um, We want to help you grow in grace. We want to help you grow in faith. Um, We we want to help you grow closer to Jesus and become more like him. It's why we do what we do. But in the same breath, I want you to hear what I'm about to say. We exist for the people who aren't here yet. We exist for those who don't have a relationship with Jesus yet. And our job is to help them find their way back to God. I think next weekend, wonderful opportunity to invite someone to come with you as we take this roller coaster ride from Genesis to Revelation. Uh, Long story short, we're going to jump in to not just the story that God has written past tense, but but that's how we begin to discover the story that God wants to write through your life and through mine. So let me close. Um, And uh, I'm gonna invite our campus pastors to come in in just a moment. But I, I think this might be an opportunity. Come on, we can do this once a year where we just give God thanks for the the pastors that he has called and gifted and entrusted to us as a church. I want you to, I love and appreciate our campus pastors. 
Uh, I remember when a uh, bleach blonde kid fresh out of college uh, came to work with uh, Dr. Dick Foth. And at the end of that year, I asked Joel Schmidgall if he'd stick around just a little longer. And 17 years later, uh, I'm so glad he did. Listen, uh, Dick Foth said it la- last week, he-, he sounds more and more like his dad. That's the highest compliment that could be paid to anybody. Love Pastor Joel. I think about visiting Pastor Dave when he was a missionary and a uh, grad student in Edinburgh, Scotland. I just had this hunch that he belonged back at National Community Church. And now here we are, and he leads our Lincoln Theater campus, but also leads our missionary endeavors all around the world. Man, I, I met Pastor Joshua Simonette fresh off the football field. And uh, I had no idea that we would have the joy of being able to do ministry together and now part of our teaching team. I remember a very young, very single Mike Whitford. (laughs) Uh, I remember an athletic trainer named John Vaughn who taped up my calf so that I could run my first triathlon. Had no idea that years later he would become our campus pastor at Potomac Yard. Man, I remember walking through a tough season with Jeremy Steffens, but he weathered that storm and he came out of it a better man and now our campus pastor at Georgetown. Uh, I think about uh, singing, thank you for giving to the Lord with Rob Schmidgall. More than two decades ago, when we were in college at a little church with 12 people where we served and preached and did special music. (laughs) And I remember meeting Pastor Marion two months ago. (laughs) And Pastor Marion and Tamika are a gift from the Lord. And we're going to make some memories and, and make some ministry together. Now, this group of pastors would be the first ones to say that the heroes are the hidden figures, like Martha and Nupsa and you. But I also believe sometimes you got to give honor where honor is due. And so I'm going to invite all of our campus pastors uh, at each of our locations to come. Would you give them, give them some love as they come and share with us?